So I want to say a big thanks to everyone that is here with us today. And my name is Valerie Fortin. I'm working as a speculative counselor at the FNEC. And it's really an honor for me to be here today. Uh, so I want to welcome you to our first session of our program, Growing Together, with the goal of passing down, sharing, learning, and dreaming. The visual logo that you can see on our background is represented by tipi that symbolize a safe place where each of the poles represent respect, strength, and hope. This innovating and unprecedented training program was created to meet First Nations need, and it is the fruit of an extensive reflection. The TP is also a place where every adult is responsible of protecting, welcoming, and supporting children in their development to nurture and bring out their unique gifts. So all together, we will grow that TP and we will be that TP for our children. Also, I would like to say a special thanks to everybody who's work, who works really hard behind the scene. <laughs> so especially FNQLHCSS and FNEC and also FNQLs and FNEC's communication sector. So without, with, without further ado, I would like to introduce you to my precious colleague, and I will start with Eva and then Sarah. So Eva, the floor is yours. Oh, thank you. Well, it's a delight to be here. My name is Eva D'Agostini. There's no test at the end. You don't have to be able to spell my name. <laughs> Um, I am, uh, I'm a school psychologist and I've worked in schools for a long, long time. Um, I've also had the honor of working in uh, some uh, First Nations communities um, all, over, all over Canada, actually. Um, for a long time, I started my career actually in northern Saskatchewan. Uh, it, was your, it was in the late 70s and I had a lot to learn for sure, but uh, luckily people were very gracious with me and helped me to, to understand uh, some of the challenges that your communities face, but also what has struck stayed with me is the beauty of, of your communities, of your, of your way of being, of your culture, uh, especially your res respect for elders. Uh, so these are things that have always stayed with me. And when Valérie um, connect, connected with me a few years ago and said we should work together, um, because I will share with you a, a theoretical way of looking, a theory, a way of looking at children that I think will um, resonate with you and relate you can relate to it. And we're, we're not going to be teaching you what to do, but we're going to help you to uncover what you already have in your hearts towards your children, whether you're a parent, whether you're an educator, a teacher. Um, and so these are, this is what I'm, I'm hoping to bring. And it's just such an honor to work together with, uh, with Valérie and with Sarah to, um, to bring this material to you and to, to help you to become the adults that you want to be for the beautiful children in your care. Sarah. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, Sarah Clary in Tishnegashin. My name is Sarah Clary. Uh, I'm from Mashtouyat uh, in Lac Saint Jean, but uh, now I'm been a success, a student success advisor in language and culture at FNEC for four years now. Um, I'm also an artist. I'm a two spirit person. I'm, I'm working really hard to learn our uh, traditional knowledge and our uh, spiritual values. Um, and I'd like to invest myself, uh, my time and my creativity. So the children in her communities receive this gift of language and culture. It's also um, very an honor for me to be here uh, and learning by your side with Eva and Valérie. So you can now share your PowerPoint, Eva. Okay. Go. Okay, so today, as we said, this is our first session on growing, understanding the emotional development. And uh, we'll, we'll just have a quick, clue at, a quick view at our menu. So the 
we will have a look at how the program works. So today is a theory part, and we also it's followed by a time to share. And I think Sarah will talk to you a little bit more of the time to share. You're muted. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. First time, but probably not the last. <laughs> this training <laughs> was designed designed to develop our know-how together. So we really wanted to offer you a moment to receive the theory, but also a moment to move forward in the approach. So that's why we create this time to share. Uh, it's a moment to observe, reflect, uh, revisiting the concept learned in during the, the theory training, the workshop, but also it's uh, it's a moment to uh, to welcome uh, elder and special gift uh, special guest uh, in those session, and um, it, it will be very important for you to well we hope for you to join in in this moment of sharing. So that's where we we can grow together in this uh, this training. Um, I experienced it myself. Uh, the content of the training uh, will require uh, an openness and uh, for you to get to get uh, your heart open. Uh, but at the end of it, uh, uh, if you're patient with yourself and with us, um, you will find a, a great gift, a gift uh, that will probably help you understand uh, what's going on in the arts and the ed of our children. And maybe you will realize a, a lot about yourself too in this journey. Thank you. So all our material will be recorded and will be put on our FNEC uh, YouTube playlist. So you'll be able to re, re look, re have to have a look at, at it again if the part that you missed or if you want to share it with somebody. So it, that's where it will be. And also you will be able to find the information on... Um, on uh, the, I'm sorry, my FNC is calling. Uh, uh, you will be able to find the info, all the information on the Facebook page. So today's agenda uh, is that it will be our theory. And then after that, you will, we will have questions and answers that you will be able to ask. And that's what feeds us also, you know, so don't hesitate, don't be shy. And then uh, it will be a pleasure to answer. And at the end also, uh, I have a little uh, feedback survey that I would like you to answer. So it will help us also to build our sharing time together. So now it's time for Eva. Good. All right. Oh, no, you wanted to talk about the curriculum. I wanted to talk about the curriculum <laughs> just because if some of you are teachers or working in schools or even parents, you might have little ones that are going to K4. So the 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 all the material will be giving you is really touches the emotional and social development of a child. So it kind of set the base to your to to be able to guide your children into their social and emotional development. So it, it is a fit. <laughs> yes. Yes. And, and when we, you know, we know that reading and, and uh, numeracy and those kinds of things are really, really important and language, obviously very, very important. Um, the interesting thing is that when children are well in their emotions, when their emotional well-being is taken care of, these things come spontaneously. And that's basically what we're going to, to look at today is we're going to look at the ideal situation. What's the best thing that can happen? How are our children meant to be if everything went well, if we got it right? And uh, I'm the parent of two children who are now adults. And I still look back and say, oh, I wish I had done things better. Oh, I wish I knew what I knew now. You know, I wish I could do it. But it's never too late. I have to let you know it's never too late. My children were in the young adults when I learned this information and just using it helped my relationship with them and their relationship with me. But even more importantly, I saw how I just saw lots of growth and development them in them, even though they were doing well. And so this is what I want to share with you today is, is just to make sure that we really understand and respect and look at our children as these most incredible beings and I know that's what you think but just to remind ourselves that they are because sometimes they do things that 
you know, don't make us so happy, but there's lots there. So we're going to look at the personality, oops, of young children. Uh, we're going to, uh, you know, remember that they're egocentric and they're impulsive and they're inconsiderate and they're unthoughtful and they're, but they're curious and they're joyful. And there's so much, you know, they have lots of things that go for them, um, especially now that we have our four-year-olds and our young five-year-olds in, in school is that we know that sometimes they don't get it right. But what we have to remember is this immaturity that we see, it's not a mistake. There's nothing wrong with the child. And I, I mean, for me, I love four-year-olds. I think they're the most, the, the funnest kids. And, and if any of you have ever tried to have a birthday party for your four-year-olds, and you know what happens at the beginning of the day, it's the best birthday party I ever had. <laughs> And then at the end of the day, every four-year-old birthday party, this is the worst day of my life. And you think, I just spent all this money on this birthday. That's the worst day of their life. Can't they be grateful? Nope. That's the way they are. They have one emotion at a time and they live it with their whole bodies. And that's who they are meant to be. And that's part of who they're growing to be. And so what this, the way that I'm going to be, what I'm going to be sharing with you today has made me realize everything, every part is beautiful and it tells us something and it's going to help us to bring our children to what they need to be. You know, it's not about having all the answers, <laughs> But it's about being there for the child, being the answer to the child. Um, this, you know, this little interaction that we have between Sarah and this little girl. The little girl needed help. And so Sarah was there helping her. She just knew what this little girl needed. And she just was there. And what we want to do is create the environment where they can reach their full human potential. Because every child has that capacity within them. And so when we are looking, especially at our preschoolers, but we're also talking about our K-4s, our K-5s, even our grade 1s, our grade 2s, and this program is for, you know, from 4 to 8, if we understand them from the inside, if we can see that that little 4-year-old who is sobbing her heart out because it's the worst birthday party in the world is actually doing what she needs to do as a 4-year-old, which is living deep sadness, so that later in life, she knows what sadness is. If we tell her to, oh, stop crying, then maybe she won't ever really know what that truly feels like. Of course, it breaks our heart, and that's the hard part. But we're going to look at our children from the inside out, and it's going to make a huge difference for our ability to tolerate some of the behaviors that are, you know, kind of not so easy to do. The basic message here is that we as the adults have to work. And when we do the job of being an adult, then our children can rest. And when they rest... We know they're resting because now they start to play and their play becomes so interesting. And when they're playing, then they're growing. And that's what we want to do. Do what nature intended. And Sarah, I'll let you take over from here. Okay. <laughs> First of all, I'd like to, to, uh, to say it's really an, an honor to talk about this topic probably some of you who will watch uh, this uh, know uh, better than I. Um, I'm still in a process, been um, really tried to um, asking questions and also thinking about this um, learning, what it is learning for First Nation. Um, so on this picture, you can uh, I maybe um, bring your attention on this elder. His name is uh, Shalapi Belfleur, uh, really respected elder from Munamun Shibu, uh, La Romaine, um, Innu community. Uh, and um, he's, I think he's really proud of his grandson on these pictures. He's also a traditional drummer. And uh, that day, uh, I asked him a very important question. Uh, I asked him, uh, well, how our ancestor and our elders teach children. And then, so he took, uh, I took him in a place where, well, we start recording and he start talking. So after two hours, my uh, camera ran, ran out of battery, <laughs> but it didn't run out of answer. <laughs> so he told me to came prepare next time that I, I asked him a question like that. Uh, so that day, the teaching for me was that uh, those questions are very complex question, uh, but her elder really know how to teach because he was prepared to give me two, uh, two days of teaching about this. Um, and so I, I realized it was also a very important and sacred question for us. 
And uh, so I, I'd like to just think about this day as a day that uh, it was very important in, in my learning also. So um, it's with a lot of humility and I, I really want to say that, that I, um, I present this content. First of all, I'd like also to thank our uh, non-native allies that are in our school, our daycare, are part of our communities, and they also play a very important role in teaching our, our children with us. Uh, so, Tanish um, Kometen. So, you probably heard this expression, it takes a community to raise a child. So I, I ask myself what, what it really means. So all of us, uh, we have a responsibility and a duty to protect and teach children uh, to meet their needs. Traditionally, and still sometimes today in our communities, uh, all of us are involved in the education of children, uh, uncles, aunts, grandparents, kukumushum, and extended family. We all have a, a bigger role to play. And we have to lead by example. This is very important also um, because we were learning, uh, we were um, learning by example and also by observation and experience in our traditional, uh, tra tra oral tradition. Um, also elder were a very good teacher and uh, I asked myself, well, why they were very good teachers? Well, they have a lot of experience. <laughs> and also, they know how to create strong human connection. So they know how to uh, pay attention with their observation. Well, what this little one need? Where is that in this development? Uh, what are his gifts? And, and they are feeding uh, the, the, the children into their gift. Uh, and sometimes uh, they have uh, also ritual, like the working out ceremonies. Uh, the working out was not at two years old. It was when the children is ready. So they are really good at looking at every individual and knowing when this person is ready to receive this teaching. Um, also, something that we can see on this picture is the uh, holistic uh, learning um, way of thinking. It's also in the medicine wheels. So it's connected with the um, lifelong learning. And again, what, what does it, that mean? Well, it means that uh, our emotional spheres, our physical, mental, and spiritual spheres are inter interconnected and interdependent those fears have an impact on each other. Like when we have emotion, sadness, will, tears will appear. So it's very a strong connection with our emotion and our physique. And we can feel that when we don't feel good or so we, we can feel that we need all of those fears to be in balance, to be in harmony. We will go deeper in this important and strong meaning uh, during the 12th session of workshop and, the, and, and also in the 12th sharing session. So you will have time to share with us, I hope, and I'll, I'll take time to learn from you. Um, so uh, yeah, so that was a little bit about how we used to, uh, to learn in, in a traditional way. Great. Well, thank you, Sarah. And um, well, we'll. I, I'm. I'm hoping that the. Um, I know that the theory that I will be sharing, um, many parts of it will resonate with those with those intuitive and not deep knowledge that uh, that your communities had, and that's what we're hoping to to help in store. So. So yes, you know we are going to also look at the brain. We're going to look at the neuroscience. Don't be scared. <laughs> <laughs> it's my passion, Valerie knows. <laughs> I love talking about the brain. And, uh, but it's really important because our brain is part of who we are and, and it has its job and it's very good. And, you know, they're even able to look at a one day old baby. But what's really interesting is they were studying, they wanted to say, oh, well, what does the brain do when, you know, somebody talks to it? What does that baby, baby's brain do? But what was really fascinating was what they found out was that at one day old, when the mother spoke to the baby, the language part of the brain lit up. But when the nurse spoke to the baby, a female nurse, it was the voice recognition part of the brain. Well, the language part of the brain, basically, the baby said, let's go. I know who you are. Um, I'm going to, you know, like I want to, even though he's not able, the baby's not able to talk. The baby's there, can hear you, knows what's going on. But when it was somebody they didn't know, the brain went, I don't know who you are. 
You know, so basically, I don't know what the researcher, Maddie's Lasson, decided about this, but what this said to me was, oh my goodness, right from the minute that they're born, children function better in attachment. And the brain is telling us that that's not just a myth that we have. This is this is deep knowledge. And what's interesting is that um, cultures, cultures, you know, that knew that but they didn't have to talk about it. But unfortunately, nowadays, we need to sometimes talk about things that we didn't used to have to talk about before. So Dr. Neufeld, uh, this is, work is based on, on the work of Dr. Gordon Neufeld. I'll show you a picture at the end so you know who he is. He's also a grandfather. Um, he basically said, okay, well, um, we're going to try and understand children. I'm going to try and help you to understand children. And he looked at lots and lots of different research and lots of different things. And he likes to keep things very simple. And my goodness, I mean, I had been a school psychologist at that point for about 30 years and, you know, um, had children of my own. And I knew there were things that I wasn't happy about. But when he explained it in his way, I thought, oh, my goodness, this, ma this makes sense with what I know. He says there's three basic things. Every time we see a child, especially a child in difficulty, because let's face it when children are doing well we don't really know I mean we notice them we love them but you know we don't worry about them too much but when something's not going well oh my goodness you know what what's going on with this child well he says look the first thing you need to look at is how is this child developing you know um, are they a four-year-old are they a 14-year-old it makes a huge difference how old they are but are they uh, are they showing us signs that they're not developing as well that as they should so we're going to look at maturation then the thing about maturation is that in order to grow, you have to be soft, but in order to be soft, you have to be vulnerable. You know, and I, again, I love this photo here because that little girl closed her eyes and then she had to trust that the person who was touching her was going to touch, touch her with gentleness. Through that interaction, through that softness, her, she, her whole system learned something quite wonderful, but she had to trust first. But it's not always easy to be vulnerable. So how can we help our children stay soft and vulnerable? Well, we do that through attachment. When they feel safe with us, when they, they, they know we're there for them, then they can stay soft. When their brain is soft, their brain can grow. And oh my goodness, amazing things happen. So let's look at what amazing things happen in maturation. So first of all, it's a natural process that unfolds according to a plan. There we are. Um, it, uh, it can't be forced or practiced or pushed. And I love tomato plants because the tomato plant flower is spiky and yellow, but the fruit is round and red. No gardener gets upset when they see the spikely yellow flowers. They don't try and make them round and red. They just go, yay, the flowers are here, you know, and they don't worry about it. And I remember talking to some, some people and, and an older man, I was talking about this and I said, it's like tomatoes and it takes 80 days. You have to be patient. And he raised his hand. No, madam, it takes 90 days. I said, well, could it be 85? Oh, no, madam, not if you want a good one. We have to be very patient to get the good ones. We, you know, if we force it, we don't, you know, you guys all know what those tomatoes taste like that they force to grow, different from the tomatoes you have in your garden. It can become stuck. We all know children who act younger than their age. We all know adults who haven't really matured. But the good news is that the potential continues throughout the lifespan. And some of you may have experienced that. You had huge difficulties in your growing up, but then you, you got into a circumstance where people respected you, and all of a sudden you started to grow and develop. And, but the thing we have to be careful of, because in education, we try, we try very hard sometimes to, to kind of get kids to do things we want them to do sooner. We always, we're so happy when kids read when they're three and do this when they're five and do whatever. But we have to be careful because as human beings, as Sarah said, as human beings, we are complex. You can't explain it in two hours. You can't even explain it in two days. So why would we think that by forcing a child or pushing a child to be able to do something, it means that all of the child is growing. And I use, again, plants. Um, I had this geranium that, you know, took a long time to flower in the summertime. I was a little frustrated with it. I got this beautiful plant here from a florist. It had gorgeous flowers. I went away for four days. When I got back, <laughs> my geranium, my, my azalea had died because... It, it, I forgot to ask somebody to water them. Well, my geranium had been growing roots. So if it didn't get watered, it actually was able to survive because there were so many roots. It could gather just a little bit of nurture from the uh, moisture from the thing. This plant had hardly any roots and it died. So yes, it's lovely if a child can sing and dance and do all sorts of fancy things, but we need to grow the whole child. 
And so basically it develops, it requires patience and faith. If it's not happening this year, it'll happen next year. You know, it will, it will, we need to take the time. We have to be able to be different, differentiate between a child who acts mature and a child who's been given the time to mature. And sometimes a child who acts mature will try and please us and be so smart and be do this and do that. But it doesn't really come from inside of them. It's because they're trying to please us. But when it truly happens from inside of them, it's like there's no question. They get it. It's who they are. But it takes a long time. And so we just have to be careful that we're not working too hard at training, but we're actually giving the time for maturity to happen. <laughs> I love this cartoon. I think cartoonists get kids way better than psychologists do. Of course I'm acting childish. I'm a child. And we need to remember it, especially our four to eight years old. They have so much growing that they have to do. So how do we know a child is developing well? Well, again, there are three big processes that kind of give us a sign that the child's on their way for developing. Dr. Neufeld gives them some of these terms. They're not terms that we use very often, but if we emerge and some emerge, come out, right? Um, integrate, put things together, adapt get, you know, be able to manage and handle situations. So we're going to look at each of these for just a very quick moment. Not so much that, again, there's not going to be any exams in this course at all. It's more going to be just to give you a feeling for, a flavor for what's happening when a child is developing well. So this emergent process, it's inside all of us, and it pushes us to be, to have vitality. You see a child who's developing well, they're full of energy, their eyes are signing. You know, they want to do things themselves. They want to venture forth. I'm, you know, we have this little guy, oh, where am I going to go on the map, right? And it helps us to want to become a separate being, to be able to, cap to be capable of functioning separately and independently. And we need to remember, before our children come to school, they push themselves to walk. You know, they pull themselves up. They do all sorts of things. And that shows us that emergent energy that they have. And so when we see a child who's emergent, what are the signs that we see? We see that curiosity. They have plans. They've got their own ideas. And again, our four-year-olds and our five-year-olds are so good at this. Is I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. We look at them. You can't do that. But it doesn't matter. It from, comes from them. They're creative. You know, they want to draw a blue apple. They draw a blue apple. You know, they want to draw, you know, they've got lots of vitality. And, and they even bit by bit, now this takes a long time to develop. This doesn't happen at four and five years old. Poor, more around seven or eight. They start to realize, oh, my friend isn't happy with me because I did something. Right. Of course, they want to do things on their own, but they're also willing to be dependent, but they want to try it first. And they're aware that other people have a different way of looking at life. All of these capacities actually grow and develop when attachment needs are met. We, I've often, as a psychologist, I heard people say to me, we need to teach him responsibility. And when I learned this material, I realized, oh, he doesn't have a sense of responsibility because something didn't go right in his life. And he didn't grow that yet. But if we help him, he will grow it. And this is it. We're growing these things in our children. We have another process, which is really important to us as human beings, which allow us to become social beings. And again, you know, we often say one of our, our, our goals for bringing our children to school is to help them learn how to get along with others. But actually, again, Getting along with others is part of a process because getting along with others means it's not just about pleasing them. It's also about remembering who we are. It's a mixture of two things that come together without merging in with each other. So it's really important that children kind of know who they are and then start to realize there's somebody else in the world. So it makes them civilized and responsible and considerate and respectful. Now, where does that come from? Where does, where does it come from? The ability to see conflicting elements, the ability to be able to realize, well, on the one hand, and we can use the example of sharing, right? Most kindergarten teachers pride themselves that they've taught their children to share. And absolutely, we can guide our children, we can help them, we can model it and whatever. But there's something really quite interesting because sharing is all about on the one hand, you know, I want to play with this, but on the other hand, so does my friend. Mm, what am I going to do? I want to be happy playing with my truck, but I want my friend to be happy too. Hmm, how does that happen? Well, these conflicting elements, our ability to just see a little bit more, okay, come with the 
development of our prefrontal cortex and our corpus callosum, which basically joins the two parts of our brain together. I mean, we'll probably look at that a bit later. But what we need to understand is, and this is why the brain science is so important, because the prefrontal cortex, the part of our brain that can hold the idea of me and somebody else, doesn't actually start to click in to, until five years old. So what happened in kindergarten? Well, it's so interesting because, yes, the teachers talked about sharing and modeled sharing and whatever, but actually the children start to have the capacity to truly share. And I've had some kindergarten teachers say to me, oh, Eva, now that I know this, now I can see the children that are sharing because they want to please me. And the children who are sharing because their prefrontal cortex is starting to kick in because the ones, the one who try to please me go, miss, I shared. But the one whose prefrontal cortex is developing is playing with the truck and someone says, can I share it? And they go, and they stop for a minute because their little brain is going, on the one hand, you want to keep it, but on the other hand, he won't be your friend. And there's this, oh, and then maybe they'll share because they want to have a friend. So it's amazing how it happens. So it's, but it's five to seven years old by that time that thing happens, that ability to have this two different feelings. And it takes until the mid 20s to stabilize. So in other words, there's lots of stuff that's going to be hard for us to do. But what it brings to us when this develops, now we can be cooperative and considerate and tempered and self-controlled and patient and just and courageous and have perspective. And of course, when we look at these, we say, oh, my goodness, if we knew adults who were like that, we'd be really pleased with them. But this takes a long time to develop because that prefrontal cortex, it starts at five years old and then it grows and it develops until 25 years old. And, you know, if you're lucky and sometimes way, way later. And so it takes a long time for these things to grow and develop. We can model them, we can teach them, but until the brain is ready to receive them by its development, it won't happen. But it will happen if we just give it time. And we know all the research shows us the brain develops best in attachment. Now, there's another process called the adaptive process, and this leads us to becoming a resilient being. And the thing about the adaptive process, which is a real challenge for us as human beings, and especially for those of us who take care of children, is that in order for all of us to become transformed against that which we cannot change, and by the way, we are all living right now in a world that we can't change, <laughs> it won't stop, <laughs> you know, this pandemic will not stop. But at some moment, we actually have to go deep, deep, deep into our sadness. We have to let down. We have to accept that we cannot change this world. We need to feel that sadness about a world that will not change before we can actually bounce back. And this is a process that many people have studied, um, you know, uh, uh, and Dr. Neufeld particularly. Uh, it's called the grieving process. And grieving is not just about death. Grieving is about losing a world that we are used to. We all of us needed to cry about this world that was changing. And it's a process. And what it is, is in order to get into that process, is we need to have a soft heart and a safe place to cry. And I think that, the, and so what do we mean by a soft heart? Well, we need to be able to tolerate feelings of vulnerability. And the only way we can tolerate that is when we're with someone that can keep us safe. And again, we've seen many, many examples of that. Some of you um, have, um, have friends of yours that they, they start talking to you and then they say, I don't know why I'm crying. Well, because they had this sea of tears inside of them and you're their safe place. And they could let down that, 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 that shell that they had and they, now they could feel their vulnerability and they could just have their tears. And one of the most important things we need to know is that when someone is crying, we don't need to know why they are crying. The tears are healing in and of themselves. Um, and I know that in, men, in your culture, this is often a, a, a teaching that tears are important. And again, we can talk a lot about this and we will over time talk a lot more about this. But I just want you to, to understand that how do you become adaptive and resilient? It's by actually having your sadness and tears. And then when we can do that, now we can learn from our failures. Now we can understand that the world doesn't always do what we want it to do. Now we know that we aren't all perfect, but I can do a workaround. 
Now I can bounce back. Now I can be resourceful. Now I can be confident when things don't work my way. You know, and this little girl, she had to figure out a way to drink water from a water fountain that she couldn't reach, right? And she probably was standing there at that water fountain and then maybe she was going to have a tantrum because nobody was there to help her and there wasn't anybody there to help her. And I'm sure just before she figured this out, her little face went, oh. And in that moment of sadness, her brain said, we can figure something else out. And all of a sudden she said, oh, I could do it this way. So she tried a number of different things and she found something that worked. But she had to feel her sadness before that could happen. So adaptation happens in attachment. And so just want to show you here that really what we're talking about is attachment allows, is the, is the conditions. It's like the roots of a tree that allows us to grow a beautiful, beautiful tree with lots and lots of, of, of fruit. You know, and so basically there's the tree. There's the human being. I'm not going to want you to read all these things, but these are all the wonderful things that we are programmed. We are programmed just like the apple tree is programmed to create this big tree full of fruit. The human being is, is we're programmed to do that. These things will happen. You know, and this was, I mean, certainly one of the things that, uh, that I noticed, I, I work a lot with, um, with with special classes for children with severe behavior problems some of them are in the elementary some of them even in the secondary and you know by the time children get to secondary school they've experienced a lot of difficulties the program really worked at making those children feel safe and I remember the day when I really understood this this really does work was when one of the teachers said to me Eva I just got to tell you what happened um, we had this boy, he's been in our program for two years, Eva, you know what a challenge he's been to us. I'm not sure he's getting any better, but she said, I got to tell you what he did. There was this other boy in our program, about two years younger than he is, and they were skating and they were having this race. And, um, and the, uh, the, I saw the older boy, like he's doing his best to race with this younger boy. And then all of a sudden, he let the little boy win. Now, in that program, we don't use a reinforcement or, you know, praise or any of that kind of stuff. I mean, we appreciate the children, but we didn't do a lot of praise. So she didn't go over and tell him how wonderful he was for letting the other little boy win. But boy, was she ever curious. So she went up to him and she said, you know, I saw that you I saw that you let him win. You know, and of course, he was proud of himself that she noticed. And then she said, what was going on? Well, miss, he said, you know, he couldn't handle losing. Oh. <gasps> At that moment, she said, my goodness, those two years of him being with us, he's starting now to be able to think of other people. Now, he couldn't, he could think about a child who's two years younger. Two seconds later, he could have been very mean to the other 14-year-olds or 15-year-olds. I said, look at what your program has done. You didn't reinforce kindness, you grew kindness. And that's what we're talking about here, having the patience over two years to grow something so our children can become who they were meant to be. Now, we need to talk about vulnerability because this is a huge topic. And again, in many of our sessions, we're going to look at this more in depth. Vulnerability, allowing ourselves to be touched by someone else, right? To have that softness because when we can trust other people to take care of us, then our brain doesn't have to do that job. It can allow it can do its own job, but we have to trust, and it's really hard to trust. Growth requires softness, which means being vulnerable. The only thing is that when the brain senses that it is too vulnerable through separation and trauma, it protects itself. And now there's studies that actually look at that and see that. This is not just an idea, psychological idea. This is actually known in the neuroscience. They can see brains that do that. So when it's too much to think about something, you can even not remember something that happened to you because your brain says, if I go there, that's going to hurt too much, right? The only problem is that when the brain is protecting itself, it cannot be growing. And so this is why we need to really be aware that for some of our children, it starts with letting the defenses down and allowing the child to feel safe before the growth will happen. If there's too much separation, too much alarm, too much shape, shame, these beautiful things, adaptation, emergence, and integration, actually don't develop as they should. And so we need to understand that for some of our children, this has been their life and we need to help them with it.
and they end up being very emotionally immature. So you have a 12 year old who acts like a four year old emotionally, not my fault. You know, it was all his fault. I don't want to share. Sharing is dumb. And we think, oh my goodness, I got to teach this kid responsibility. And now my thing is, oh my goodness, what happened to this child? So that that natural impulse to help, that natural impulse to want to do better isn't there. Uh Uh-oh, something happened. That shell went on. And of course, what is it that makes us feel most vulnerable? And, you know, whenever I share this, there's a part of me that just wants to just feel, you know, just cry. Because what we have to understand is that what makes us feel the most vulnerable is when we're facing separation. When we experience when we experience the loss or lack of closeness uh, to, to those to whom we are attached, but when we're even facing it, when someone says, I, I don't, you know, and again, by the way, I have said this to my own children. I know that you've probably said this in a moment of frustration with your own children. I don't know what I'm going to do with you. But of course, we don't really mean it. And I know that I've often, when I see my kids, like, no, no, it's okay. It's okay. I'm going to figure something out. But sadly, sometimes children get the message, they're too much for us. So just thinking that they might be too much for us can also cause huge problems, let alone real separations. And we know that that many of you and many of you in your communities have faced huge separations in your life. So when we have this alarm of attachment, and we're going to look at, at the roots of attachment, it's, it's the threat of not being with you know, I don't know what I'm going to do. Or why aren't you like your, why aren't you like your brother? Or you know what, you know, and sometimes we say this, you don't belong here. Or you know what, you're not really important to me, you know, um, or I just, I just, you know, and uh, can't like you or I'm, I'm, or if I really tell you who I am, you won't be able to love me. So these are huge, lots of alarm. We're complex as human beings. It takes very little to cause us to go into attachment alarm. And we need to be sensitive about that because, because it can cause huge problems. Because when we are facing separation, our brain goes, uh oh, you better do, you better fix this because one of the things we now know about human beings is that actually to survive, we have to be in attachment. No one would have survived in Northern Quebec if they hadn't been a community. When they were in community, the community was going to provide for them. So we as human beings are wired to be very worried about separation. Um, We don't worry so much about food. We don't worry because we know if I'm in attachment, that person will feed me. And so we have these huge emotions in us, right? And look at the word emotion. We're going to be moved to fix it. Now, I'm going to share some stuff with you here that might be a little bit difficult to hear. And I'm sorry that if it is, um, but we can talk about later and you can talk about it in the time to share. I don't mean to, to, to make you feel badly, but I just want you to understand that some of the behaviors that we see among our children, some of the behaviors that we see in our communities were at the attempt of the brain to fix a separation problem that it, and then when it can't fix it, then it causes all sorts of problems. So the normal thing that happens when any of us faces separation. So let's say my husband is on a trip, which doesn't happen anymore, but let's say he's on a trip and he doesn't call me. And so uh, now he's got a cell phone. He didn't have a cell phone for a long time. Now he's got a cell phone. So what am I going to do? He hasn't called me for a while. So is there something wrong? Well, I'm going to text him on the cell phone. Yoo-hoo, did you forget? Don't forget how to use the, you know, let me know you're okay, right? So that's pursuit, perfectly normal. Now he still doesn't write to me. Oh my goodness. Yeah, because that, that, you know, when I text him, it's because I'm going to, you know, move to, to restore the proximity. Well, now when he doesn't text me back, I go, "Uh uh-oh, what's wrong? Is something wrong with him? You know, Um, and, and so, you know, so now I'm going to go, okay, now what can I do? Maybe it's bugging him that I'm texting him too much, you know, or maybe my tone wasn't good, but something's going on. And so I change my behavior a little bit. I say, oh, honey, like, I don't want you to be mad at me, but I just kind of really need to know if you're okay. Right. So, but the other, the other thing that happens is we have this emotion called frustration and frustration moves us to try and change things. So it might well be that when he comes back from his trip, I'm going to give him a big hug. And then I'm going, oh, thank goodness you're safe. But I'm also going to say to him, by the way, the next time, could you please text me at least once a day, even if it's just a little emoji that says, I'm okay. 
Because one of the things we need to know about these three emotions is that they're usually felt one at a time. And so it's really interesting because actually, if, you know, let's say he hasn't contacted me at all, part of me goes, well, if I just see him, I'm going to be so happy because then I know he's safe, right? And so all I want to do is give him a big hug. The only problem is that actually this frustration has been in my, you know, why didn't he write to me? Why didn't he tell me he's okay? And it might well be that he'll come home, he'll open the door, I'll go, oh, I'm so happy to see you. Why didn't you call me? <laughs> oh, I didn't even know I was so mad at him. Because alarm and pursuit kept the frustration at bay. And this is one of the things we're going to learn about our children is that sometimes they're going to act very frustrated and we won't even know why, but it's because it was always there. But in order for them to fix the separation they were feeling, they tried very hard to be good. I had a daughter like that. Very, very, very good at school. Huge tantrums at home. And once, and I didn't under, didn't know this at the time. Now I go, oh, I understand why she had tantrums because she had learning disabilities and a lot of problems at school, and she saved her tantrums for her mother. Wasn't I lucky? Well, actually, if this happens in your family, you are the luckiest person in the world because some of our children, it they can't even hold it in at at school, and they let it out at school, and that can cause some more problems. What we need to know is that our brains are trying always to figure out how to get people to love us, how to get back. And sometimes we get stuck in the wrong tracks, especially when we can't figure things. And this is where human beings are so interesting because some of us will do one thing and some of us will do the other. And if you have more than one child, you're going to recognize some of your children in this. Some of them are going to get stuck in intensified pursuit, which means, okay, I'm going to do whatever I can to make people like me. I'm going to be the best in my class. I'm going to win the most most um you know the most things i'm i'm then or i'm going to start collecting things because it makes me feel good to have stuff you know it's kind of a, 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 a for attachment or i'm going to i'm going to um you know try and just get anybody to love me and sometimes we get really upset with with some of our children some of our older older children because they they kind of fall in love with just about anybody and you know one one person after another and we go oh my goodness you know why is that happening well when they haven't been able to feel satisfied in their primary relationships they just try and find any kind of a relationship or they can become very anxious or they become very agitated or they can have compulsions and obsessions you know sometimes if i just everything is neat in my house then everything will be okay. And some of us, you know, clean and clean and clean and clean, but cleaning doesn't make it okay, right? And sometimes we, of course, go into anxiety reduction. We, you know, do other things. Or we just have lots of frustration. We are just upset with everybody. We're attacking everybody or we're attacking ourselves. So I, I don't want to scare you with this, but if you understand that separation is so key, and it causes, we try and fix it. And sometimes we fix it the wrong way. And so what we need to understand, and, and I love this quote by Alexander Denheiser, is when a flower doesn't bloom, you fix the environment in which it grows, not the flower. We try so hard to fix all these behaviors, but actually, if we fix the environment, it's amazing how these behaviors will start to go away. And of course, how do we fix these? Through attachment. Attachment is the answer. It's the primary need of a developing human being. Growth takes place in the context of attachment. And as a safe attachment figure, you take, you care about, but you also care for and take charge of. It's very important for us to understand that loving our children and just giving them everything they want, which is, of course, a natural human tendency, we really want to make our children happy. But there's also, we understand that children need someone that is willing to stop them from doing something that's going to hurt them. And children, they don't like it when we say no. <laughs> <laughs> you say the word no, and sometimes your children are going to let a few choice words come out. <laughs> I hate you. You're stupid. You're always saying no to me. But actually, there's a part of their brain that's relieved. Okay, this adult, this adult knows. And they did a study of adolescents, of teenagers. And they asked teenagers, um, when they were 19 years old, what did you appreciate about your parents? 19 years old, they said, I really appreciated when my parents said 
you know, gave me limits. Now, if you're raising a 14 year old, there is no 14 year old that's going to appreciate the fact that you told them they can't go to that party. They're going to call you every name in the book, but five years later, and they're going to also say, and everybody else's parents lets them go. Five years later, they're going to say, I appreciate my parents gave me limits. And the children whose parents let them do whatever they wanted, when they asked, what do you wish your parents had done for you? They said, I wish my parents had given me limits. So we need to find a way of loving our children, but also giving them limits. And we're going to talk about this in one of our other sessions. When children let us take care of them, we have a natural authority. You know, and again, I think the concept of elders and guides and leaders is so beautiful. You know, you sat at the foot of and you listened. And you let him guide you. And it's a natural hierarchy. He wasn't being, he wasn't, he was just taking the lead. Luckily, when we're attachment, we love them. And, you know, high school teachers don't understand kindergarten teachers at all. But luckily, you guys love kindergarten kids. And it doesn't bother you that they have runny noses and that they, that they wet their pants and do all sorts of other things. Right? That doesn't bother you. And kin high school teachers go, ooh, I wouldn't have to clean the nose. Oh, that's horrible. And then you look at the high school teachers and say, but I don't get you guys. You know, I don't get how you can like those kids who walk around, whatever, and tattoos and this and that. I say, how can you like those guys? And the high school teachers go, oh, I love that. It's so cute when they do that. Perfect. That's what attachment is all about. When you're attached, you can you can endure all sorts of things. When you're in attachment, now you have a sense of rest and home. Some of you in your schools, the kids walk in into your classroom, they take one look that you're there and they go, oh, I'm home. I'm safe. It's okay. Right? And boy, if you weren't there yesterday, where were you? <laughs> right? Because they need us as the adults to feel safe. And again, we're going to talk about a whole community in a school to help children because it can't always be just one person. Now, when we're attachment, we basically, it's a compass point. When children don't know what to do, we want them to look to somebody who is more mature and has more experience. Because if they don't know what to do, it really isn't helpful if you're 14 years old and you ask another 14 year old. It isn't, really isn't helpful if you're a four year old and you ask another four year old, what am I supposed to do? If you've ever watched four year olds and five year olds together, you know, as a four year old go, will, will try to do something and then one of their friends says, let's do it, let's do it. And they get into all sorts of trouble because it's a five year old guiding a five year old. You know, a child, if they don't know what to do, should look to the teacher who can then guide them. And when they're in attachment with us, they will naturally look to the people that they're attached to. They're going to want to keep close to us they're well, going to want to obey us and behave for us and we're going to talk again how some how this all happens what we want to know is how can we help children stay attached to the adults who care for them because as i say attachment is very vulnerable so we need to have a very warm invitation again little things that we always talk about is every morning greeting your children every in in the classroom every time you go away and somebody else teaches them and you come back warmth 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 i'm happy to see you i'm happy to see you and children go oh thank you good some children, of course, unfortunately, experience a lot of disruption in their life. And so they're going to be resistant if, they, if the adults who were supposed to take care of them are having a hard time taking care of them. They weren't going to be that trustful to other people. And so we're going to have to work even harder to help them feel safe with us. And of course, for some children, they've got put that shell on. They don't cry. They're tough. They don't care. And so, again, we need to work at helping that shell come off. And boy, when we see even just a little tiny tear, a little thing of that hurt my feelings, then we know, OK, it's starting to happen. And so this is this is the role that we want is to make them feel safe enough that their hearts can become soft again. Really, we are creating that relational garden in which children can grow. And uh, one of the people that uh, has, has worked on this material, and especially for, for four-year-olds, is Deborah McNamara. And she says, inside of our children is a developmental plan to be unfolded. And we are the gardeners that nature needs. And I love this picture because the adults are busy. And Sarah, you can tell us what they're doing here, but I think they're collecting something. And they're doing their job and the children are playing. They Maybe they were supposed to be doing whatever the adults were doing, but they were probably paying, playing. And as long as the adults are there, they feel perfectly safe. They'll take care of us. 
and now we can grow and play and and you know do whatever we can do next next time we're going to be talking about play and the importance of play but this is the message that i think we want to give here is have faith in that developmental plan so the two people that have inspired this material and not, that who's based is dr gordon newfeld who is a developmental psychologist and dr deborah mcnamara who was one of his students who wrote a book particularly specifically about about preschoolers so i'm just going to uh, stop sharing here and then we'll bring up back up that slide at, at the end. So Valerie and Sarah, if are there some things that you would like to share? Well, thank you, Eva. Uh, every time I hear you, it's, it put a smile on my face and I try to reconnect with my, my own relation, my own attachment as a children but also as a as a mom and i can tell you you give me such a good tips and and i remember i remember that i need to to go into this teenager's room and just hey i am here and and, and since i work with you my my connection with my my, my son husband and family it, it grows so much nicer and now I understand why also what's happening in, in, in the mind uh, of a, a little one. So yeah, I can make also a lot of relation with uh, our elder um, and an ancestor used to teach and used to look at them and then follow their, their rhythm, not pushing on them, but just watch, okay, he's ready. And it's still happening these days when, when I go for a teaching, well, I feel like the elder, they, they know just right away what the amount of teaching they need to teach me and if I'm ready or not. So, um, yeah, finish committing. <laughs> so, well, yes, thank you, Eva. Again, it's, uh, I go along with, with what Sarah just said. Uh, and it's a good reminder for, for people who's working, especially with our young children or who are taking care of young children. And oftentimes there's so many action or behaviors that we just don't know why it's happening. But, and then we also, as, as, as adults, sometimes the social pressure, am I doing it right? Am I going along with society wants me to be doing for my children? But oftentimes inside of us, like inside of me, I would talk as a mom, there's something in my heart telling me what I should be doing. And it's called instinct. And when I follow that, usually I go along with natu natural development of my child because I know what is best for him. But when I put aside social really hard. pressure, which is really, really hard, because if you do something and I had some teacher telling me, well, I just feel like hugging him, but can I do that? Well, of course you can, but that's kind of what makes me sad that can we do this? So what people will think if I, you know, if I'm, if I'm giving that child time, you know, if I take time to look at him, because maybe somebody else will say, you're giving him permission, you're giving him something that he should not have. But when you look at children's development, when you look at what is going inside, then you find the answer. And it's such in a peaceful, it's, it's all, you know, it's like, I, I don't have the exact word in English, but I, I think it's called harmony. You know, it's yes. yeah. the rhythm and it's all in harmony, you know, so. Exactly. So thank you. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, I mean, uh, as I say, I, um, I, I, again, it was in the early days when I was uh, working with, um, with, with classrooms of children with huge, huge behavioral problems, especially the very little ones, you know, we use this approach with them, but the teacher was saying, Eva, you know, are we really doing the right thing? You know, and I said, well, you know, you, you, you have to make it look like a classroom, but you have to give a lot of space and whatever. And uh, so at the beginning of the year, they weren't giving the children much work, but one little boy had been in the program for two, for a year before. So he was coming back the second year. And, uh, and the teachers were being very, very careful because they knew that the children had to feel safe with them. So they didn't give them hard work because of course these kids like if their work was too hard poof, it would be thrown away so it was so funny because the teacher said to me the little guy came up to me and the, the one who had been there the second year and really knew them well I said miss when are you going to give us real work 
You know, this was a kid who got referred to the program when he was five years old because he used to throw his work across the classroom, let alone his desk. And we just took care of him for a year. And all of a sudden he wanted to work. That's emergence. That's emergence. The, des the desire to work. He asked the teacher, can I work harder? And of course, at that point, we put him in a regular, you know, helped him go into a regular classroom because he wanted to work. And it's really hard because we have our curriculum, we have our competencies, we have our goals. And yes, it's important to, you know, guide our children. But, you know, if a child is here, we can gently bring them bit by bit to where they need to go as they're developing. But we do have some of our children. And it's not a question of intelligence. I need to really, really help you understand. It's not a question of intelligence. They have done so much work has done, even with children who've been you know, tested and found to have a mental handicap. When the environment was created, all of a sudden the brain started to learn things. I, I have a friend who has a very, very severely disabled child, very severely disabled. Um, and he didn't really learn to talk until he was 15 or 16 years old. But when he was 25, he started to talk in sentences. It took till he was 25. But people told her when he was a young child, he'll never talk. No, he might not talk at the same age as other children. And this mother, of course, she was incredible in what she did for him. She created the environment. But she had to wait till 25. But it'll come. And that's why we have to have this faith that some of our children are not ready, but they will get there. You know, and the pandemic is kind of going to be teaching us that too, because we can't follow those rules and regulations so much anymore. But some of our children will actually come back to school and they'll learn just like this. Because when your brain is ready, you can learn something really quickly. Anyway, I know that we wanted to leave some time for people to make their comments, to answer their questions. Um, so don't be shy. There is the chat box. I don't see there wasn't too much in the chat. Oh, there's nothing. Is there anything in the chat? Oop. No, there is no, there's no question. Everybody, if you want to write a question, it's the Q&R just below uh, the presenters just right beside the only participants so you can type a question or maybe raise and yeah but um comments yeah. also i mean one thing i'm just curious about is there something that i said that that you kind of already knew and that you're happy to have heard again you know like that would be one thing that i would be curious about is there something oh, there's that a there's the a raise and so uh, I will allow that person to talk. Okay, good. Hi. Just to unmute her mic, yeah. I just cannot unmute it. Oh, there you go. Hi. Okay, hi. Uh, I just wanted to say it was nice to hear. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. It was just nice to hear and uh, reassuring uh, the way you explained like their development that you would just have to give them time and stuff like that. Because then uh, being a teacher, it's like one of the biggest stresses, you know, getting them to all these goals. But um, yeah, so just to hear all this, it, it was really nice and it takes a lot off of um, our shoulders, my shoulders and I feel. So thanks. You're welcome. Thank you. So we have another comment. Eve, Sarah, can you read the comment? Um, oh, it was uh, a comment from Joe. Very interesting. No question yet at this time. Yes, I heard some, some and happy to hear and learn about here. Good. So I have made a, a survey, which I will send you right now. It will be in the uh, in the chat box. And didn't we have? Uh, yes, we have. Uh, we have a yeah for next for next time. Yes, just so that people remember, we um, we have a session next week, which would be a follow up to this session.
And so um, there's a Zoom link, um, which is available also going to be available on the Facebook page. Um, and we could probably copy it and put it into the chat right now. So if people are able to come next week. Um, and what we wanted you to think about was, you know, if especially if you have the, the luxury of seeing children of different ages. I mean, if you're in a school, you might pop in to see the, 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 the K-5 or pop in to see the grade one or go from grade one and look at the four-year-olds and just observe. And I think this is the biggest thing that, you know, we're asking you to do is just look, just look at it. You know, where are the children? How do they, you know, you can see them behave. And I mean, and of course we know physically by seven years old, they can run so much better than four-year-olds, but just watch, just watch. Can the, are the seven-year-olds more able to share, more able to have that interaction with, oh yeah, what are the four-year-olds like, you know? And so just notice those differences. And then that would be something good to talk about uh, when you get, when we get back together again. Um, and also the other one is, um, is, now that you understand that separation or facing separation causes alarm inside of a child and causes distress inside of a child, just watch, just watch when, and it isn't just about when, you know, the mother might drop the child off at school and the mother leaves. And obviously you can see that. But even if let's say, you know, that a child's, you know, and again, I know there's not much traveling going on right now. In fact, for many of our children, interestingly enough, um, if, uh, if they have a, you know, a, a good relationship with their parents, for many of them, they're happy that mommy and daddy are home. They're not driving all over the place. You know, they're happy. You know, I mean, there are other tensions that happen. And I'm very glad that I don't have a whole bunch of, you know, little kids running around my house right now, but I'm, I'm old and maybe don't have quite so much patience. But, but you know, um, maybe you know that a, a parent has gotten sick and had to go to the hospital and sadly maybe, you know, so on. So just, just watch, you know, sort of how, look for signs that a child is getting upset because maybe they think we won't care for them if they're being that way. And it's really interesting. Once we start noticing that, we start realizing, oh, um, I mean, I remember one little boy, the teacher said, I don't understand, Eva. He's perfectly fine. But when I've got a group of kids, sometimes I have to raise my voice. And she said, why every time I raise my voice, does he start running around like a little like this? I said, oh, well, because for him, when someone raises their voice, the next thing that he hears is, and I've had it with you. So I said, you know, I, I guess two things. One, if you do have to raise your voice with the other children, because the other children need to hear you, you need to say, okay, well, he's going to behave like that because he can't handle a raised voice, right? And it was so, it was, she said to me, oh, thank you. Okay, I'm not going to be so upset. And of course, she worked really hard at not having to raise her voice. But when she did raise her voice, she says, okay, he's just doing what's normal for him. It's hard on him. So, you know, these are the kinds of things we want you to just kind of notice a little bit. I don't know, Valerie, if there's anything else that you... And well, uh, also when we think about separation, there are moments that we are separated from the person we are attached to, but it doesn't really mean that that person is not there physically. That person can be there, but you know, if somebody is on doing something else and not taking, you know, not physically, mentally there for the children, that's that kind of created also a separation kids that go to sleep it's a separation also so I don't really want to get into that but those moments that we are apart kind of and and separated from that person we kind of we can observe and I've been observing that also with my child when he was younger now it's it's okay but when he, he was like that and I could see things that he was doing and I was like why, why is he doing that but then I could uh, I could see that it was when he that, that I, I wasn't there you know I wasn't there or so I had you it didn't feel good because he couldn't see me so I had to work to make him feel that I was there even though if I wasn't there so yeah. just look at that yeah uh, I just yeah. want to see some I think I have the wrong date on the on yeah the... yeah <laughs> oh, no I'm so sorry <laughs> it's next week it's uh okay I noticed a few other things so next, it's not fourth it's the Wednesday the 11th the 11th it's for an hour, so and so it yeah. will be, and it will be nice. Yeah. <laughs> so, so yeah, for those of you, thank you very much. I really appreciate. Uh, um, so just, uh, it'll be February. It'll be a week from now. <laughs> yeah. So just, uh, just here in the chat box, uh, there is a link that leads to a survey. I would really appreciate if you can. Uh, 
fill it up right now. It's really short. It's your name, your email address, because because I just want to have your email address so I can write you and we can really develop and give you some uh, some information when we have it. So it will be easier. And so if you can just fill it up right now, I will be really appreciated. Feel free to share the workshop and um, it, it, it will be really nice if more people join in and so we can share together. I think it's some content that everybody need to hear. Uh, and um, and in, the, in those time too, we really need uh, proximity even though we are far away. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah, we can't be there in person with each other, but of course this way more people from all over can join us, right? So it's uh, the disadvantage of not seeing people's faces and being in the same building as they are, but the advantage of being able to be quite far away and still be able to join. The other thing as well, um, obviously the recordings are going to be made available. So if somebody missed this session, they can listen to it. But I think every one of the sessions, even if you haven't heard the other sessions, it actually is going to make sense. Because that's, that's been my experience with this material is we're going to really work at making sure that even if only can attend one session, that you can make sense of it. So if for some reason you wanted to attend and you didn't get around to it and you say, oh, I can attend today, please do. Please come. But the, with the sharing one, it is kind of good if you listen to the recording before you come for the sharing. I think that's important because we'll be talking about the about what was presented on that day. You know, so there's, it's a it's a very, I mean, it's a long course. It's 12 sessions of theory and 12 sessions of sharing. So a big commitment, especially in this time when we don't know from day to day what's going to happen. But you know what? If somewhere in May you say, oh, I like that topic, come, come, come listen to the topic, come to the sharing, because you'll get something out of it. Um, I have two, two people who answer the survey. We have a new comment. Thank you. Well, thank you yeah. for joining us. It's really appreciated. And thank you for answering also the little survey. Yeah. Um, I'm going to put up, I hope it's the right link for um, for uh, Zoom for next for next week, next uh, Wednesday, right? The, the, the sharing time. It's, uh, if not, double check on the Facebook. I think face, it, the best place to check is the FNECCEPN Facebook, right? Like yeah. that would be the place to go for information. For yeah. sure. Yeah. 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 So, Sarah, do you have anything to say before we... Well, it's uh, like I, I've asked it really well. Well, sometimes we don't need to like say names on emotion on everything sometimes we just need to sit there and l let the other person or the children know that we are there so uh, it happened to me last week and my my uh, teenager threw a remote control in my face and I, I started to cry but I didn't know why I was like oh my god I have so much emotion so sometimes you just don't have to know the the reason but uh, just proximity and, and just being there it's it's enough so thank you for being here. Yes. So thank you. So I guess it's the end of our first session. Excellent. Well, lovely, lovely to have started this off. Yeah.